the world from Octopost headquarters. This is Radically Transparent, Octopost's original podcast show on B2B Marketing Now. I'm your host, Jennifer Gutman, Director of Social Strategy, and in most episodes of this podcast, we'll feature B2B marketing leaders who will share their radically transparent truths behind being a modern-day marketer and what it takes to grow ideas, take risks, and impact change. Joining me on this episode of Radically Transparent is Howard Kravitz, CMO of Winston and Strawn Law Firm, Am Law 50 Law Firm. <laughs> Did I get that right? Uh, Close enough. Yeah. Howard, <laughs> I'm really excited to have you on the show. And I know that, you know, for those listening, they know my my background is in B2B marketing at Octopost. So feel free to, to clean up that title if I didn't get it right. That's fine. Awesome. <laughs> you don't worry too much about titles over here. There you go. I like that. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. And I know that a lot of our listeners, we've been doing some interesting following of different law firms. And, you know, there's a, a lot of discussion today around how are law firms even using social marketing? I think your title is very interesting, right? CMO, um, quite a, a large law firm. Could you give us a brief look into your professional journey and perhaps how you found yourself as CMO at Winston and Strawn? Sure. So I have a history of sales and marketing positions. I spent a number of years in financial services. Okay. I actually was a stockbroker at one point making 300 telephone calls a day, begging people to buy something from me. And that, that led me to the banking world. And I spent some time there. And then I became an independent consultant. I traveled around the world really talking about sales and leadership and strategies and negotiating and making great presentations. PwC became one of my largest clients and okay. eventually offered me a role there. And so I had a couple of different roles there and I finished as the marketing leader for the United States, essentially the chief marketing officer for a $15 billion US-based firm. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, right. And I th I always thought the legal industry would probably need some help from people like me. And, and that led me to Debevoise and Plimpton, which is another top mm -hmm. law firm in the world. And, and ultimately to Winston and Strawn, where I became the chief marketing officer of the firm. It's really interesting to me because I, I from what I understand, and you can definitely keep me honest here, it's almost like this is maybe a, a newer type of role or an interesting role, I should say, in terms of being in a law firm and doing marketing. And I'm sure we're going to dive into all of that later on in the show. But I feel like it, it's almost a relatively new, maybe not now in 2021, but concept when you join, right? You came from the fintech space over into the law to help them with marketing initiatives. And I'm just really excited to dive in. But with that, you know, I'm just thinking out loud and I'm wondering as a CMO of a law firm, I can only imagine <laughs> there must be things that have you tossing and turning at night and keeping you up professionally. Could you share with us maybe some of those things that, you know, have you wondering, are you even doing your job in a way that's being effective? Sure. I think about that all the time, actually. <laughs> For the, the legal industry, particularly at the top law firms, we live in an unbelievably competitive environment. And for me to sit here and say that there aren't good law firms or nobody stacks up to us is, is really not the truth. And there are very, very accomplished lawyers and wonderful firms in the world. So what typically keeps me up is, is really the competitive nature of this game that we're in. And I think all the time about our, what is the competition doing and how are they positioning themselves and how are the partners and the lawyers and those firms stealing share or acquiring market share how do we compete? How do we find that little niche that allows us to essentially win more work than the next person? Absolutely. And I think what's also interesting, right? So, I mean, and I'm curious, maybe you can um, kind of explain this to us, but what makes law practice marketing, right? In all of your experience of marketing, so different Right. You shared part of it. Right. Lawyers are experts, brilliant people, brilliant minds. Um, but what makes it so different from other industries and, and how are you actually able to stay ahead of the curve? So I think it's a couple of things. Number one, lawyers, by definition, are professional skeptics. <laughs> we are often faced with defending a strategy or looking at a potential target and 
usually the people inside that company are also lawyers. And so they doubt, you know, what you might say or how you brand yourself or how you market yourself. So number one is the fact that in general, this profession, particularly at the top and at the elite level, you know, they really sort of been there, done that. They think they know it all. And in many cases, as you said, they're very, very smart people. And I always say they are professional skeptics. They are trained to argue against whatever it is that the other side might think is the right answer. Secondly, I think this has always been a relationship business. Yeah. And so it's a person to person. It was described to me many years ago as contact sport. And I think that the buyers and the decision makers are often basing those decisions on the relationships that they have with another human being. Yeah. So those human beings are often asking themselves, how does marketing, business development, has any of that helped me? You know, this is about, I know this person and I've done quality work for them. And so they look to me for advice and counsel and they hire me and really, I don't need you. And that has to be tough. I mean, here you are coming in as CMO where, you know, I know in, in our, in our, instances a lot of times we're kind of battling with sales right as marketers battle and, and you know i know you you shared that you have much experience uh with sales but a lot of times battles with sales you know why why we do this right you have the relationship with the client and marketer you're asking me to do what um and it sounds like you have a similar perhaps even may art i would maybe argue a more difficult challenge um, because you have, you know, they're experts in their industry. Um, and, you know, here you come on in and consulting them on how to market. And then, like you said, they're asking you, well, I've worked with this person for years. Why do I necessarily need to do X, Y, and Z? What's interesting as well to me is that when I think about lawyers, Right. And, and we said it. They're, they're brilliant. They're experts. Um, as, as you coined, um, <laughs> what was the, ske the professional, professional skeptics? skeptics yes. <laughs> so what's interesting to me is I don't have a doubt in my mind that when it comes to digital, digital first experiences or digital marketing, that that these team of people don't know that that's where they need to be. But it seems from the outside that law firms are oftentimes behind in terms of digital marketing and digital transformation. And it's hard for me to understand why. Could you maybe dive into that a little bit and why you think in your opinion that law firms are behind in digital? Yeah, I think it's a, it's also a couple of things like answer to the last question. It's always a few things, a mix of things, right? Yeah. So we have, we, we have a slow recognition of the fact that people buy from people. And there's there's this wave in the law firm or in the legal industry, as you move up in the ranks of partnership, generally speaking, people, the most experienced partners, the best lawyers in the firm are often have been around the longest. Mm -hmm. And so they've, you know, the idea of digital transformation or using digital feels somewhat, why would I do that to, for them? It's, to them, it's a, it's a people business. And what we try to do in this profession, as we try to do in many, I'm sure, is recognize that buyers, you talked about it at the outset, you said you're, you're in the business B2B space. You know? I often talk about B to I. We're businesses talking to or selling to individuals. And individuals have a consumer experience as well as a commercial experience. And in today's day and age, people can look up anyone on the web, they can they can investigate your company. They can look at your service. They can look at your the articles you may have written, the posts that you've had. They can follow you on LinkedIn, of course, or Twitter, or yeah. any or any other of the social media tools that are available today. And I think that what happens is we forget that by the time one of our partners meets a new client, mm -hmm. that client probably knows. 50, 60% of all there is to know about one of us. And they, they're wow. starting to form a decision in their mind. I mean, there's certainly been a great deal of research that says that in the B2B space, 60% yeah. of the buying decision is made before you show up. So I think people are having a hard time accepting that their digital footprint is meaningful. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the buyers, it is somewhat meaningful because they're looking us up. They're yeah. doing their due diligence before we get there. Yeah. And those professional skeptics, just to finish the thought for a moment, view their 
personal expertise and experience often is the key selling point. I've done this. I've done that. I've won this. I negotiated that deal. I was involved with this public offering. I yeah. want a landmark case. And really, the question I always ask is, so what does that mean to the client? Nice. And what, what is the typical answer? What do you get? Because is that, do you think that drives the point home? Does that kind of bridge that gap that, that you know, you, you battle with closing on a, a daily basis? I think it, I think it makes people stop and think. Mm-hmm. And that's really the role that we have. Oftentimes, people do have winning relationships and they, they probably are based on a, a record of success or something like that. But I often challenge people to think about, so what does your track record of success mean to the client? Today's day and age, either we're going to get a better outcome for them. You know, we're going to protect them in a better way. We're going to work with their people. You know, there's a cultural fit. We're going to make it easier on their staff. Look at the last year. My goodness, right? Firms and partners and lawyers that make life a little easier for their clients. The pressure on budgets is unbelievable. So are we, I hate to use the word cheaper, are we, is there more value that one derives from working with us? You know, we, we have to answer those questions because the clients are asking those questions. Yeah. And I would also say, who does your client have to sell to inside their company and what's that, going to happen when they when they present Winston and Strong. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of things to think about there and I think, you know, just having you know, what you shared to stop and think, right? Take, making someone stop and think. To me that opens the floodgates of collaboration, right? Because now now it's a true collaboration. It's not just you know, maybe you sharing an idea or something that needs to happen, but you're opening for the collaboration. Um, are there other ways that you have found helpful in getting partners to collaborate with you in the creative process? Um, and if so, can you give us some quick tips? Sure. <laughs> I always start from the perspective that all partners want a lot of the same things. They want the brand of the firm to be strong. They want people to recognize the brand and usually them individually or the practice area that they work in, right? People want a lot of the same things. So if we start from that perspective, if someone is pushing back, then we have to think to ourselves, why? How is what we're suggesting not aligning to what seems to be a pretty natural goal? So I call it the art of letting them have your way. Interesting. What I often, so tips, number one, we present everything as a value proposition to the partners of the firm. We never present anything as I have an idea because that creates the partner's idea versus your idea. And in that case, the partner wins. So I always challenge my team to think in terms of what benefits the partner. And it's very similar to what benefits the client. So I guess tip number one is use benefit language. Don't assume that people understand that if you say you can reach an audience of pick a number, 10,000, uh, what does that mean? Maybe out of those 10,000 people, there's only two people that could ever hire us, right? So let's talk in terms of we can reach decision makers. Right. We can reach people who can hire you so that you can get more work. Right? That's, that's probably number one. The second thing is recognize that partners are owners. We serve in this business at the pleasure of the partnership. So if they're resisting, it means that somehow they have a view that what we're doing is not going to shed good light on the brand of the firm. So I drill down on that a little bit generally. So number one, use benefit language. Number two is ask a lot of questions about, let's put ourselves in the decision maker's shoes. How will they feel about our brand? And does that align with the way we want them to feel? So those are, you know, a couple of tips. And then I would say the third thing is you're always better off when you have the owners of the firm engaged in the decision-making process because ultimately it becomes their idea. We give them all the credit. Fine. No problem. (laughs) And if it's their their idea, it's much easier to sell around the firm than it is. I don't I don't know if you've ever seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding, but there's a scene where the mother is explaining to the daughter how, you know, a mother's role is to be or a wife's role is to be. And this might be dated. I know it's 2021, but, they, <laughs> uh, you know, the role that the to be the neck 
and that the husband's role is to basically be the face. And so the, the, the art form there is that you're actually the neck, which that's what you were explaining that to me. That's the scene that actually popped up. Um, I know in 2021, things may be changing, but uh, a good good <laughs> my kind of analogy there, I want to jump into kind of the, the area that I find most interesting when it comes to law firms, and that's social media. And that should be no surprise to anyone listening. Um, but with social media, I'm so curious because, I mean, lawyers really and partners and yourself, there's so much knowledge that you you hold about all oh, uh, different sorts of topics that the average, I, you know, average, I would say, citizen of the world may not know, let's say, their rights or how to navigate certain situations. So when I think of social media and thought leadership, for example, um, and the potential that partners have to build this incredible brand for themselves on social, it's interesting. One, are you tapping into that at all? And two, could you share with us a little bit about your marketing plan for 2021 and, and how social fits into it, if at all? Well, social is a very important part of our overall marketing plan. And it should be a part of pretty much anyone's overall right. marketing plan. So I would agree with you on that. And in the legal industry, there's we have to be a little careful that we're not uh, advertising for lawyers. There's a lot of laws and regulations around. Oh, really? Yes, you know, you're right. Like, it's, like, it's kind of regulated in some. Correct. Right? Okay. And we also have to, have to find that those spaces where we're making people smarter. So it's. Generally, we have some partners who are terrific at almost daily. They read an article and then they post that article. It doesn't have to even be written by one of our partners, but they make comments on it. Okay. And, and they have a following and people read their comments and now they want to engage in a discussion. So they you know, reach out and contact them. And for those partners who are constantly posting information that's relevant to their clients and making comments about it, I think that's you know one key strategy is is find information that you think would be useful to your following. Yeah, I guess you have to create a following first. But if you're posting, <laughs> and that, it's a different episode, right? Yeah, it's a whole episode. If you're if you're posting useful information, people are often often looking at your posts. Right. Second thing is we do publish a great deal of content, and particularly this past year, we and other law firms as well, you know, we created a COVID resource center. And it was a place that people could go and find information about how they needed to cope, react, behave, what the legal ramifications were for some of the things that were going on during a pandemic. Yep. And so that became a bit of a destination. And it also allowed our partners to be able to post daily. So if you were a labor and employment partner, your clients are worried about how do, do we open our offices? How do we keep people safe? You know, are we potentially going to be sued you know wow. are we allowed to ask people to prove that they've been vaccinated before they go oh my gosh there's a thousand questions and so if we're posting information we're writing content about it you know people are interested and they're looking at it so social makes a really makes up a really big part of our overall marketing strategy and we have some people go it's not for me okay and we yeah. highlight the winners if you will we always highlight success Mm -hmm. And we see we've moved from uh, you know, automatically tying a post to what we call a new matter in this world, the work, getting hired, uh, to the anecdotes from so many partners now were, yeah, this is great. I'm going to post this to my LinkedIn profile. Right? They, they want to do it more and more. And, and we, we offer training to them and we help do their bios. And, you know, I have a team that's dedicated to that. So. That's it. So in our yeah, in our world, I think we we coin it employee advocacy, or I guess this could be uh, partner ambassadors or partner advocacy or employee partner advocacy. Advocacy <laughs> is great, and we also, you know, you you touched on the word advocacy. You know, we're often looking to hire the best and the brightest and recruit other partners to come to our firm, and so we do talk about our efforts around racial injustice yeah. and some of the social issues that are in our world today. And you know, I'm very proud of our firm's efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we certainly like to brag about some of those things because they're important to you know, any number of people who are thinking about choices that they have to make. 
Absolutely. And I think also what, what all of us marketers have learned after COVID is the power of authenticity. I think when brands are able to bring that to the table, whether it's a law firm or, you know, where I, the world I'm from, B2B, uh, off to post, if you can bring that to the table and authentically right, connect and build those relationships with your community on social, I think you, it goes a long way. And, and it really helps to bring about interesting conversations needed conversations, but also show that, you know, what matters to your brand and people want to see that in your messaging. Um, So, you know, I'm thinking about this out loud. And I think what I'm hearing so much as we go through each question is how much you truly care about the partners at your firm, um, the relationships that you foster and build with them. And again, I just love that challenge of, of having someone to stop and think and really collaborate. What's the one thing that you want most for your partners from a marketing perspective this year? Fight for your share of the work. I think that people have generally relied upon doing great work. And if I do great work for my client, they'll call me back and hire me again. And that is somewhat true and often very true. (laughs) And at the same time, There are so many people trying to steal your client and they're sharing thought leadership and they're calling them out of the blue and they're checking in on them during COVID. And basically they're showing them a a level of love, if you will, that if we're not doing at least the same, then your relationship is at risk. And I, I don't think people really truly deeply understand the risk of their their relationships moving somewhere else or a piece of work that perhaps we should have gotten going to a different law firm. And, you know, that's a wedge in the relationship. And now that that other lawyer has a piece of the work and now now they show them enough love and they get the next piece of work. And before you know it, your your revenue drops and you sort of go, gee, how did that happen? Why doesn't this person return my call? And I can't believe they hired that law firm. I, I do that better than anyone in the world. And it may be true, but if you weren't present, I always say to, you know, the thing that I say, and I'm putting my finger up here with the number one is <laughs> be, be, be first. So you may, right? you may, you may or may not be the smartest person in the world on a particular issue, but being in front of the client first on that issue increases the likelihood of your success dramatically. I think a main takeaway that everyone right now is, you know, it's, it's radiating is be first and I'm raising my finger, be first, um, but also beware of wedges. And I think that's some sound advice um, for everybody listening. And, and with that, that actually brings me to my last question. It's my favorite question of the show. Um, Howard, it's been a true blast. Uh, can you share with us? I mean, we know uh, your CMO, we can go on LinkedIn. We can see your great career history. Um, what's one thing you can share with us today that is not on your LinkedIn profile? Yeah. So Jen, <laughs> thank you for sending these questions over in advance. I've been thinking <laughs> about this one. I, there's, ac- there's actually two things. Okay. Most, most people don't know about me. Number one is I was, I was the night custodian in the high school I graduated from. Really? You know, with my college degree. Can you dive into that? That's a, 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 well, you know, I was looking for work. I mean, like like a like a lot of people was looking for work, and I was a college graduate, and I I had done some things which I'm gonna talk about in a second, and I you know I needed I needed work, and a buddy of mine was working at the high school and said, hey, I can get you a job as an night custodian, and I said, oh, okay, do it. And you sweep the floors, you clean the toilets, and you know, you you learn some humility that way for sure. And the second thing that was really interesting part of my life is I was a private investigator for a number. Were of you really? And that, that, you know, that, that served me very well because it was, it's almost like being an actor. You have to get into the mind of the person you're investigating. And it was really very, very interesting. It was private insurance, mostly insurance investigations where people were claiming that they, you know, could never work again. And I would literally do background checks and follow them and do surveillance and take videos and pictures. And actually one of my videos was the first time that a video was used in the New York State Supreme Court in a civil trial. So, wow. How do yours as a private investigator? So I think Howard, <laughs> if marketing doesn't work out for us, I think you and I should start our own business because I actually also have 
Um, I have a master's degree in counterterrorism, and I've done a little bit of security work as well before my marketing career. So perhaps it's a prerequisite for, for talented marketers. Perhaps that, that's the security world and investigation world is where we learn all of our skills. But uh, if if marketing doesn't ever work out for us, I know who I'm calling. <laughs> well, one thing, one thing for certain about the kinds of roles that you just talked about is people have to spend time putting themselves in another person's shoes. And I think that is a key requisite for any great marketer is to think like the target audience and to put yourself in another person's shoes. And, you know, in the legal world, that means putting yourself in the shoes of the partners, putting yourself in the shoes of the clients, right? So, you know, we constantly have to, what's in their mind? What are they thinking about? Howard Kravitz, the wise words of Howard Kravitz. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a true pleasure. Anyone listening, if they want to be in touch with you, if they want to continue the conversation, what is the best way to reach you? Find me on LinkedIn. It's really easy. It's <laughs> spelled just like Lenny. That's the easiest way to find me. Howard Kravitz. There you go. Thank Thanks, you so Jen. much, Howard. Talk to you soon. Take care. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to the Radically Transparent podcast brought to you by Octopost, the only social media management and employee advocacy platform architected for B2B. I'm Jennifer Gutman, your host and director of social strategy here at Octopost. And if you love today's show, we'd love if you subscribe, rate, and give a raving review wherever you get your podcasts. For more discussion on B2B social media marketing, be sure to follow Octopost on LinkedIn. And of course, to gain access to all our free social media marketing and employee advocacy resources, head on over to our website, www.octopost.com. Until next time.